I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14, joined by Stuart Lackey for our uh, usual, usually weekly conversation on Kentucky sports. Uh, got got a little interrupted with the snow here in the Nashville area. Sledding may or may not have taken priority over sports last week that's in right. Lee Out. That's, that's how it goes when you got school-age kids. It was fun. It was worth it. But lots to talk about. Been a while since we caught up. A reminder, this video brought to you by Bet Online. NFL playoffs are right around the corner. The NBA season in full swing. Bet Online has you covered with all the up to the second odds, news, and scores, with additional odds, lines, trends, and info on both desktop and mobile. You can access the world's best wagering information anytime. Head there today, get in on the action, see all the updated odds. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to get your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Stuart, we're going to talk some football later in the show, but let's start with basketball. Oh, and it was an interesting week, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, I say week the last two games. Let's rewind. Let's start with the positive. The game okay. against Georgia, we, we saw Big Z put on a show like he was some combination of Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and and Steph Curry all rolled into one for about fifteen glorious minutes in Lexington. Uh, Kentucky let – I'm not going to say let that one get away because it, it's still one, and I don't think anybody ever thought Kentucky was going to lose. But it got yep. closer than it should have. Uh, but, boy, let, let, let's start with the with the big guy. Um, yeah. Th- th- those were some minutes you won't forget anytime soon. Well, I, and again, all the Kentucky pundits and broadcasters were, you know, in the, in the SEC crew or ESPN crew, where were you when, right? Yeah, uh, that I think it was one of those moments, and you know, I I was I can remember when John Wall, you know, played his his only year at Kentucky. I was at the North Carolina game at Rupp, and just how electrifying that was. And people say, okay, I remember you know being at that game. That was a seminal moment, Calipari's first year, and and what was to come. And then Anthony Davis blocking a shot against North Carolina in the championship run in 2012. I remember um, that game. Well, I, I'll remember this too, just because of the buildup. Uh, Ivasic obviously was the saga of getting that kid over here and then getting him enrolled. And then the NCAA approval process took forever. Uh, and then to have the kid go home during the holiday break and, and some thought he may never come back just to you know allow him to get ready in a better environment, environment for the draft. And lo and behold, Kentucky found out Saturday morning the day of the Georgia game that he was cleared to play. And I think it surprised everybody and the kid didn't disappoint. I, uh, he's obviously a professional. Uh, he's played in, you know, professionally uh, in Croatia and he took advantage of the opportunity, um, you know, four or four from the field to start the game off. Uh, and yeah, didn't disappoint. It was just amazing. Um to watch the celebration, the exuberance of the fans, and, and many people I've talked to that were there at the arena say it was one of the best home environments because of that in a long time. We'll get to the South Carolina game because there's some interesting questions in the wake of that one, but let's stick with that for a minute. Two guys yeah. that have been just so solid for them are, are Trey Mitchell and Antonio Reeves, which should be no surprise. They're I guess the two most experienced guys on the team. Those guys gave you what was it? Let me look up the box. I think both of them gave Kentucky over 20 points. Yeah, Reeves 21, yeah. Mitchell 23. Mm-hmm. Just continued night in and night out to be so solid and, and sort of bedrocks of this team. Uh, wh- what did you make of what they've been giving Kentucky lately? Well, I mean, it's, it's again, the, the value of having upperclassmen as a, as a blend with the exceptional young talent on those teams where Calipari has had deep runs, he's had those elements and, you know, Antonio Reeves has blossomed into not just a spot up shooter, Chris, but has been able to create off the Mm -hmm. bounce, get in the lane, finish through contact and has really shown a a more complimentary complete game this year. Uh, his final collegiate year. So I think by all measures, his decision to return was great for Kentucky and and also great for him in terms of draft stock. Uh, Mitchell, you know, before the the seven footers returned, Kentucky was, you know, a bunch of guards and Trey Mitchell in the post. And 
And and so Mitchell, again, shows his versatility on a, on a nightly basis. He can step out and hit the three. He opens driving lanes when he does that. And then he also can bang around in the post uh, and, and get a, a, a necessary rebound or two uh, as well. So those guys have been um, leaders for the majority of the season, and they showed it against Georgia. And then you bring in the complimentary uh, guard play, wing play around them. Uh, that's when Kentucky's at its most uh, dangerous to opposing teams. And then there was Tuesday night. And then there was Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, we're, we're going to hit it from all sides. That, that was one of those games that I've had some concerns about Kentucky, the focus, the defensive efficiency. And I get some of it, like the, the points against Georgia. Kentucky's playing with a big lead, and that happens. But that also happens to other teams. The right. numbers are what they are. My, my question out of the Big Z thing was, okay, that's another part. They've already got McDonald's All-Americans sitting the bench that you got to find playing time for. That That's the that's the flip side of the coin. It, it, look, is it, Kentucky has a problem that any coach in the country would love to have with all those players. Uh, and that's ultimately the answer is you got talent, and that should fix things. But you, you do have a group of guys that's been used to playing together. You introduce a part like that into it, and I'm like, I, I don't know where this goes. And, and then there comes – Tuesday, and I'm like, what, what, what am I watching here? Um, and, and sometimes that's just basketball. That happens. Sometimes you run into a hot team. Like, for example, Jacoby Wright, who's not a three-point shooter. Crushed it, yeah. It, it's fourth. And, and, and sometimes that's just – it's not your night. Yeah. But I thought they'd be more competitive. South Carolina didn't have Miles Studi. He's one of their best four players. Right. You think this team gets stronger adding Big Z. It, but it's also very young. I'm, I'm not going to hit the panic button yet, but but I think there are some concerns that that are that are valid at this point that need to be resolved. Well, a number of things. Let's just start with this. Kentucky has the number one scoring offense in the country coming into mm-hmm. Tuesday night, right? 91, 91 points a game, best in the country. They're one of the worst defensive teams in the country. And um, I, I think it, one of the commentators last night said Kentucky has a national championship offense and a, and a round of 32 defense. And I think that's a great way to, to look at it right now. It's it's the commitment on the defensive end that just isn't there. And they've been good enough offensively to run most teams out of the gym. Yeah. But South Carolina, Chris, showed the recipe of how to beat Kentucky. Be very physical, muck it up, slow down the pace, mm-hmm. um, challenge you know, three point shots, run people off the three point line and just, you know, jam the pick and rolls and and make it really tough for Kentucky to get in motion. Uh, South Carolina did all of those things. They beat them on the boards. Uh, They beat them in assists. Uh, Kentucky, I think, made four three point shots, took 13. South Carolina made 11. South Carolina came into the game shooting 36 percent from three point range. They shot 46 percent against Kentucky, which a lot of teams do. Right. They 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 kind of rise up to the competition when Kentucky comes to town, but that doesn't explain. Look, Kentucky lost to Texas A&M a week ago on the road and allowed 97 points in that loss. Okay. It's yeah, it was an up and down game. A lot of this is the function of the number of possessions that Kentucky typically is, you know, enjoying in the course of a, of a game. That's the speed of play. Yeah, you're going to see some high-scoring games on both sides, but that doesn't explain last night. That doesn't explain yeah. Tuesday against South Carolina. They were they were absolutely manhandled. And for any team or any coach that's watching and looking for the recipe, South Carolina showed you how mm-hmm. to beat Kentucky at least right now, as of January. We'll see if Kentucky can respond. Let's give credit where it's due. Lamont Paris is doing a tremendous job at South Carolina. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he is. Uh, Calipari acknowledged that in his post-game remarks, and and Kentucky has struggled uh, to pl- to to get wins, and a lot of teams do. And that's a tough place to play. Sandstorms blasting, uh, you know, constantly. Those teams get up, and uh, this was a big opportunity for South Carolina, and they absolutely were dialed in. And he's, you know, obviously doing a great job there. Um, they they play a certain way, and they're the best defensive team in the SEC right now. Um, so hats off to, to South Carolina for, you know, for taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, all right. Oh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. Just great job. I mean, hats off to him. 
full, full disclosure, I'm 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 kind of watching the game last night, kind of not. I'm I'm taking the kid to basketball practice. So I'm I'm listening on the way to the gym and watching on the phone and watching him. And so I don't know what happened or didn't. But Reed Shepard only playing 15 minutes on Tuesday yeah. kind of caught my eye. And when he's out there, he was uninvolved. And, and right. to, to be fair, he he got a a bunny layup that you and I would have hit that he missed. So I don't know if something was just off. But to me, on a, on a team where he has been so valuable, I think at various points of the year, I thought if I had to stop today and pick mm-hmm. an SEC player of the year, he'd be my guy. And, again, I, I don't have access to all the information, but I'm just sitting there going, why is this guy playing 15 minutes and why is he almost invisible while he's in there? And maybe the answer to that might be all the other parts need to see what he's got. It's not like losing to South Carolina. It's going to knock them out of the tournament. But from a from a putting your best guys out there right now, today, uh, Reed, Reed Shepard's better than getting 15 minutes. Well, and he's played more than that. To be fair, last night was not the case. Calipari, I think, looking for any type of mm-hmm. uh, combination – to uh, affect the game defensively, you know? And so I, you know, and a lot of, a lot of Kentucky fans will say, Chris, you know, well, let's look at Justin Edwards. Okay. This kid comes in. He was the guy coming in. He was the McDonald's all American. That was the projected top five pick in, in next or this summer's draft. And the kid just hasn't played up to the hype and to the potential. Now, all the if you see him on the court, if you see, he has the tools, he's obviously a great player. But for whatever reason, Calipari has chosen to stick with him in the starting lineup. And I think he had two points last night, and he played what twenty three minutes. So back to mm-hmm. your comment about Shepard. Okay, at at what point, as Kentucky gets further into conference play towards the tournament, does, does Calipari make the decision to not only steal or, or take minutes from Edwards and give them to Shepard and to Dillingham, but yeah. when does he make the decision to put Reed Shepard in the starting lineup as an example? And I think those two guys are interchangeable. Uh, the Edwards is just not giving the team really anything in terms of contribution um, night in and night out. And you would think – if your shot's not falling or if you just can't get it done at on the offensive end, you're going to dive on the floor for loose balls. You're going to crash the boards. You're going to block shots. And he's not doing any of that either. So I would look over the next week or so, depending on how the Cats play, if Edwards doesn't make a meaningful step forward in terms of contribution, I think you'll see that those minutes start to inverse a little bit. They have to, right? You've yeah. got to get better production from that spot. Well, look. I don't have access to all the information. Again, you got more guys than you can really play. Mm-hmm. This right. team is look. Mid February is when I really start forming strong opinions about what a team is, and and when you got that many parts, sometimes part of being a coach is just being willing to lose a game to see what you have or don't have. But yeah. that did seem like kind of a strange spot to to pick with them. You know, yeah. with with doing that on the road against the South Carolina team that's been playing, albeit without Miles Studi, who's one of their better players. Right. I don't know. I, that, that, look, you've got Arkansas on the road. Maybe that was not the place to try to either. Maybe Florida. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the coach, but it just it wasn't something I expected to see coming into the game. Well, and exactly. And here's the other thing too. It's a young team, and yeah. they've struggled on the road. Right, they opened up SEC play at Florida. They won by two. Yeah, uh, they lost in overtime at a And M. They lost now at South Carolina. So they're at Arkansas Saturday night, and you know Arkansas is desperate for a win. Uh, yeah. That's a that's a that's a wounded team with all the talent in the world. We've talked about that. And again, how's Kentucky now going to respond? They have not responded well on the road up to this point. At, at, at some point, they've got to learn how to play as a team and, and get one on the road. Um, they're going to have opportunities against quality teams, uh, but it's got to start pretty soon. Um, and, and so we'll see how they respond Saturday night, a, a game they should be favored in, but it'll be a dogfight. And everything Calipari probably is preaching between now and then is, you know, hey, you, you've got to come together. We've got to play defense. Um this team has to get better defensively, period, uh, because there will be teams that will 
do exactly what South Carolina did and, and muck up the offensive end. They'll have a bad shooting night, and you'll you'll get the same result for sure. You know, he's he's kind of got a nine man rotation right now. Yeah. When when's the last time we saw that? Well, you saw it in the the 2015, you know, Final Four team, just because they had you know t- nine or ten draft picks on that roster, right? Yeah. Uh, so he had a platoon system. If you remember that year, uh, he had two starting fives, and he rotated them equally, and mm-hmm. it was all about efficiencies. Don't you know? And so he got that team to buy into that that way of playing. I, I think you, you look at. I think Ivasich is the is the wild card now because you see what he can do offensively. I mean, he's not he he forces teams to come out and play him on the perimeter um, because he has the ability to make shots. I it, I'm sure he's got to figure that out. Calipari meaning has to figure that rotation out pretty quickly because typically Chris is I think is where you're going. He likes he likes seven man rotations, right? He he likes mm. his core group of guys, maybe an eighth. But his deep runs have all been pretty tight rotations with seven or eight players, um, yeah. with the exception of that 15 team. So um, we'll see. I mean, you're going to see Edwards probably – his minutes are probably going to start to come down because people are just going to play – you're going to need um, – he's going to need more production out of that spot. And um, I think he's done actually a pretty good job. If you look at the balance of minutes over the last two games, I think he's done a good job with Ivasic, Bradshaw, and Oyenzo, his three seven footers. And they've all played well. I mean, they've all contributed, you know, with the exception of last night. Um, his three seven footers, I think, can be meaningful parts of that rotation and probably should be. Um, there'll be times when he, you know, he's gone with two seven footers at one time you know, depending on kind of the matchup and at the point of the game. Uh, so I would look for that too. I don't, I don't see any of those guys, you know, losing minutes in a meaningful way. I think they all three can, can provide pretty good spot duty and, and contribution. So um, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say one more, th- I wanted to look forward a little bit, but one thing worth to mention going back to the Georgia game, DJ Wagner yeah. had one of his better games in a while. Offensive yeah. rating of 140. I'm looking at Ken Palm in 29 mm-hmm. minutes. That's the yeah. highest since he did uh, a 162 against Marshall. He had 28 points against Marshall. He only had 18 against Georgia, but he had 10 assists, right. which was four and away a season high and only two turnovers to yep. go against that. And, and look, last night he played 30 minutes. Offense wasn't nearly as good. In fact, it wasn't good at all, 58 offensive rating. But he did have three steals when Kentucky had five. That's kind yeah. of another thing to watch going forward. Um, y- you did get some good things out of him, you know, offensively two games ago and maybe defensively against South Carolina. So that's that's one positive out of yeah. things we hadn't really discussed. Yeah, you talk about assists. I mean, again, the credit to South Carolina, they just didn't allow Kentucky to get in a rhythm to get the ball pushed forward. The environment contributed yeah. to that. Kentucky only had seven assists back to your comment last night. And uh, South Carolina had 20 on 28 field goals, made made field goals. South Carolina, that's, that's Kentucky's stat, Chris. That's what Kentucky's yeah. done to people all year. They completely flipped the script. So Wagner's a big part of that. Um, I think he's improving. You're seeing his leadership improve. If he gets around guys, he's so strong on the finish, especially with that left hand. Um, you know, it's a it's a really deadly weapon. So I I think that kid's playing his best basketball of the season, and it will only improve. Uh, so yeah, um, I, I think that's a good observation. I see this as a get right couple of games ahead. Arkansas, I, I don't know what's going on with that team. If it's quit, but that that's the most underachieving team in the league. Uh, I, I think that could have been a top 10 team in America team. Arkansas, boring a miracle, is not going to even sniff the NCAA tournament. Probably not. Uh, and and I, I would think, look, whatever criticisms you have of Calipari, yeah. one, one is not that his teams are lazy. Uh, they, they play hard. They generally don't have chemistry issues. That, that, that to me, sets up as a get-right game in Fayetteville, which would build a little confidence with the road win. And and in Florida at home, the computers have loved Florida, but it's been a, kind of a two year thing now. Yeah, go go find me the teams of significance Florida has beaten the last two years. I, I think yeah. Florida is talented, but the the list of accomplishments is short. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we get to the Tennessee game mm-hmm. a week from Saturday, which will be 
I think fantastic in Rupp Arena. But but I, yep. I feel like these two games, Kentucky needs to just go out and take care of business. I feel like it will. And I feel like those come at, at good spots in the schedule between what happened on Tuesday and what's coming up about 10 days from now. I think that's spot on. And, and you extend it even further out. I, you know, Gonzaga, again, probably yeah. not what everybody – not they're, they're they're waiting in the wings and you know kind of mid February as well at Rupp Arena that'll be one to watch as as well but yeah you go back on the road Saturday and Calipari is going to challenge this team defensively you know to get stops and and when they get Arkansas if they get Arkansas on the ropes um, to go ahead and finish this team off they have Florida uh, I think you're right two great games to set up which should be you know, a, a great matchup in Rupp Reed against Tennessee. Um, they've got to win these two. I, I think they've got yeah. to, they've got to get this done in Fayetteville to, for themselves. Uh, but also for, you know, the polls and for, uh, you know, seating, they've got to get a quality sec road win. And yeah. I don't know if this is quality because of where Arkansas is, but you can't lose that game. And then you've got to come back and you've got to hold serve at home. You've got to win the home games. So I look for Kentucky to win the next two. I think they have to. And then we'll see what happens against Tennessee. Um, they get Vanderbilt here in Nashville after that. That should be a win. And then they've got Gonzaga, um, followed by Ole Miss, and then they're at Auburn. So they've got some spots where they can get a little break here and there. But, man, the schedule of the next seven games is is pretty darn tough. Yeah, you beat me to the punch there. Um, my goodness. Tennessee twice. Yep. Uh, Ole Miss is at home. I feel from a Kentucky standpoint, that's – I think Kentucky would win that either place, but I feel like Ole Miss is a different team on the road than it, than it is at home. Yeah. Uh, may, maybe if maybe the facts would disprove me, but just from, from following that team at a glance. Um, Arkansas twice is nearly as daunting as it would have been. Vanderbilt twice, that should be two give-me wins. Gonzaga will be interesting because there's kind of a disconnect between the Zags in right. the resume and what where the computers have Gonzaga, which isn't traditionally as high as the Zags have been. I think I'm I'm sort of eyeing that little segment right there, mm -hmm. February the 17th to the 27th, because here's what you get. Auburn and Neville Arena, where they haven't been losing to anybody lately. LSU on the road. Yep. Sneaky tough game. Ask AM. Sure. LSU tripped up AM in, in uh college station and it ended yep. up being close. Alabama at home, and, and I think stylistically, um that, that could be the 1980s NBA throwback game. Um <laughs> yeah. where where it's 140 to 135. I'm exaggerating, but those oh, seems to yeah. score a lot of points. Yeah, and I, sure. I that, that's that's the game of all the SEC games, that's the one I kind of circled a while back is is maybe the one I want to watch just for right. entertainment value. And, and then at Mississippi State, which just took down Tennessee and Starkville. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's – there's some bright spots there. I think there's some games to watch. Um, but, you know, over the next – let's just call it the next six games, Kentucky, Kentucky needs to go five and one. I mean, you know, Tennessee maybe is the game that they can lose um, and, and not get dinged, but – they really need to to you know win at least five and and again if they can if they can run the table great uh, but they need some tournament high quad one type wins and they can't lose these games you can't lose to Arkansas yeah. which is probably a quad two um, game now Florida's probably quad two Tennessee quad one Vanderbilt probably quad three um, so you've got to win these games that you're supposed to win because you know if not you know, you're, you're, you're getting in those, those middle seeds where things, you know, kind of get squirrely. And so it's uh, I think, I think going back to the youth of a team like this, it's really trying to impress upon them that it's important to be in the moment and win some of these road games, because these are their opportunities for strength of schedule and for seeding yeah. and all of those things. And at, you know, will they buy in? Will they listen to that? They're going to score points. They're going to be fun to watch, but they got to win games it comes down to it. So um, yeah. Let me let me give you this stat too. If I didn't give it to you before, Kentucky basketball has played SEC has been SEC started ninety one years of SEC basketball. This is the first time 
that Kentucky has allowed its first SEC, first seven or first six SEC opponents to score 77 points or more. Wow. First time in history. So, Man. yeah. Well, to, to, to be fair, that, that might say more about the last 91 years than it does about this one because the SEC, it's been a, at least until recently, it's been a point scoring league. You've had teams that have put up pretty good offensive outputs. Alabama's done it. Uh, you know, Tennessee can put up points with Dalton Connect on a lot of nights. Ole Miss has done it. Yep. So it's, it's, and, you know, the, the teams they played so far. Well, I mean, I say that. Um, AM's having trouble scoring. Yeah. Mississippi State's not top half offensively in the league. They're not bad. And Kentucky caught State with Tolu Smith back. It's a different team with him right. than without it, which, and he missed the first two months or so. Yep. Um, Georgia, sneaky good teams. South Carolina, not a, not a great. I don't know. Um, maybe that's one of the things we look back and just say it was a, a strange footnote to the season that meant nothing, but that is interesting. Well, I, listen, it goes it goes to the style of play, but look at AM. Kentucky allows 97 points on the road in overtime. AM averages Ooh. 68. So this is a this is a in a this is a, a lack of attention and a lack of discipline on the defensive yeah. end. You can score 90 points, but you can't allow other teams to, to to beat their scoring margin against you just because of that. I mean, yeah. there's been plenty of teams in the country that have averaged 80, 85 points. You know, it, it, it's not like the teams they're playing are averaging that many. Every, it, it, it's just – it's a disconnect. Just because you're scoring 90 a, a game doesn't mean your opponent should average 85 against you. Yeah. Right? And that's – like, yeah. you look at – Look at some of the scores, Chris, of, of Kentucky's opponents, especially in SEC play. It's like they're way above their average against Kentucky. Yeah. Um, and it's like, wait a minute. What's the – and so, listen, it, something's got to change uh, because, again, you live and die by, you know, great, sh you know, shooting, you know, from distance. Sooner or later, it's going to come back come back to, to bite you. So, yeah. Um, so, anyway, I thought that was an interesting statistic, though, um, in terms of history. Yeah, and, and I've actually on other podcasts been been more critical of, of Kentucky's defense than I have here, but I figure if people watch all our stuff, they've heard that before. Yeah. Um, but but if you have it, this this is kind of the way I'd sum it up. I, I think Kentucky, in terms of parts, has got as many as anybody. Um and, and again, I, I don't really start to fully form my opinions on teams until we get to about mid February. So I think this team's got a while, and I think especially for a younger team. Yeah, uh, you could justify giving more leash, but but the longer the narrative persists, the more you've got to be more concerned. I would draw a line. I don't know, maybe start with Ole Miss at home on February the thirteenth, and like at Bart Torvik, it's a place you can kind of parse out the the data to say, all right, from this time frame to that time frame, what did they do? Right. Yep. To, to me, from that point on, like if we do a search and we start it then, and we say, all right. Kentucky from that Ole Miss game to the end of the SEC tournament was right. 25th in defensive efficiency. All right, I, I think I'm going to feel pretty good about that team going to the tournament. If, yeah. if we look up in their 80, which I think is about where they are, uh, let me see where they are in Ken Palm this morning. I, I don't think they're that high. Well, oh, they're 98 in Ken Palm. Bart yeah, Torvik's a little Palm. more generous. Yeah. But the yeah. point is, I can make the case for a team, especially a team like Kentucky. That, yeah. that they were a different team from mid-February on um, and, and feel good about it rather than get countered with the sample size and everything because of the nature of the team. But if, if, yeah. if we're at mid-March and we're still having this discussion, it, it's a problem. Well, it, and this is, the I think, the, the solace that um, Kentucky fans should feel. It's not as if Kentucky needs to improve on the defensive end by 50%. Right. If he can just get 15 to 20 percent improvement in terms of efficiency, that might be enough to make a final four run for a team yeah. like this that can shoot so well and score the ball. So it's yeah. not like you need like overhaul. D it's like just get a little bit better. And that might be enough. I, I, like, for example, let's say Kentucky, you say 98th and Kim Palm, if they were on uh, they were 70th. Right. They're probably undefeated. 
Yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, last night was, okay, they lost by 17, so maybe they lose last night. But, you know, a lot of their, you know, their game, the other three they lost were close games. So they're probably no worse than a one-loss team if they're just about 20% better on the defensive end. So, yeah. and that that is possible. Look, it is possible to improve on that end of the floor. Um, you just have to be disciplined. It's not as fun to work on defense for young players as it is to, to work on your offensive game. And so they coaches got their work cut out for them. But I think the blueprint is is set. Kentucky can get better on that end of the floor. They've got a, a better shot. Because um, right now, I, listen, are they a Final Four team? What do you think? I think potentially about as good as they want to be. Right now, I couldn't put them there. I couldn't either. Yeah. They're a Sweet 16 team right now. They are. I mean, that's yeah. where they are. And and so unless and something unless something changes on the defensive end, that's that's where they'll probably that's going to be their ceiling. So All right. you said you said something that sent me scrambling to, to Ken Palm uh to, to try to illustrate instead of just talking in hypotheticals like, oh, the defense has got to improve. Like what mm-hmm. what does the gap actually look like? I love Ken Palm. One thing about Ken Palm, the the flaw that I see. In, in his system is that everything's per 100 possessions. Okay. Um, and, and I, you, you, there's ways you can adjust for that. And I kind of, I kind of do, but no, nobody plays a hundred possession game. And that, that's one reason why Wisconsin is always so high in these things yeah. because they, they take a team with a spread between your hundred possessions on offense and on defense is big, but Wisconsin's only playing a, a 63 possession game. Whereas okay. you got teams that really fly or playing at 75, and that adds up over time. So here's where I'm going. Kentucky is 98th in defensive efficiency. They give up 103 points per 100 possessions. Uh, games are played more like at 70 possessions or 65. So yeah. they're giving up, say, for, for every 70 possessions, they're giving up 72 points. Let's look at the top of the league. You got an Auburn, 94.5 per 100 points. Actually, Tennessee's ahead of them at 91.5. Okay. Uh, so that's what, for every every 70 possessions, that's going to be closer to what? Um, 63-ish? So the difference between Tennessee's defense and Kentucky's defense is what, seven points on a per game? Which is, is not, that's not small. But it's also... Um, something that could easily be cut in half. And once you do that, the offense is so good that we're having a different conversation. I, that's, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you crystallized it there. Again, it may not be a 20% improvement from a defensive standpoint. Maybe it's less than that. My p- point is, right. I think we we're on the same page. It, it's not going to take a lot for Kentucky to, you know, to improve defensively, to win some of these close games, to get, to get stops. And, and I listen at, at some point they're going to, they're either going to do it or they're not. I think last night was a was a pivotal moment. We could look back on this season and say, you know what, that South Carolina game, those guys became men. Those kids grew up a little bit. Uh, yeah. they, they didn't like the way the game unfolded, the way that that team pushed them around. And um, maybe that's maybe last night was the uh, was the catalyst that the Cats needed. So, but I, I think those stats are interesting that you laid out. All right, we got a little football to talk as we end it. All right, uh, cool. Liam Cohen back. Uh, new quarterback. I, I I can't remember last time we did this. Um, mm-hmm. man, maybe maybe we did. I don't remember. I'll I'll just let you go now. Now that we know who the quarterback and the OC are going to be next year, what what do we think? I think I think I think Kentucky's in a great spot. You know, with all the p- potential coaching changes that could have happened, starting with Stoops at the end of the season. You know, to have your coaching staff, your DC and your OC back. Stoops is now the most tenured coach in the SEC. Um, now that Saban's gone. And so I think, you know, from a leadership standpoint, this is exactly what Kentucky needed. Uh, there probably would have been some turnover. Uh, Vandergriff, the transfer from, from Georgia, may have chosen to go elsewhere had, Co- had Cohen made the decision. I mean, it, it is a business, and uh, but that won't be the case. Cohen's uh, back. Uh, they'll do the install um, in the spring and, and look for great things from this offense especially with some of the additions that they made at the wide receiver position, the offensive line, and obviously uh, the quarterback. So um, I would say Cohen is, is, you know, is excited to be back. Uh, He's got a quarterback. I think that is more akin to a Will Levis 
yeah. in Vandergrift. And um, I think Kentucky fans should be excited about that. What's the state of them tackle to tackle right now? Well, you know, they had some departures, but they also got uh, some good news um, with uh, with the Cox uh, yeah. um, and he's coming back. So um, I need to go back and look and see who who there are a couple of people, I think, that were maybe some holdouts, but I need to go back and look. But they've got some returning uh, starters. Uh, they went to the portal uh, to get a couple other guys and. Um, I think they're in good shape. I, certainly better than I, you know, what I think many people thought at the end of the season. Um, Cortland Ford returns. He was the transfer from USC uh, that'll vie for a start at, at right tackle. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think they're going to be better than they were. Uh, yeah. Marcus Cox, the transfer uh, from Northern Illinois, who played well, I think, for most of the season at left tackle returns as well. Uh, so the continuity is there, and I think they should be well positioned um, to to have a you know a, a really good good year. So I I think the the even maybe the other um, area that you know we can focus on is is the wide receiver room. Yeah. You know, so much so much Chris was made about just the awful play at times uh, from Kentucky's receiving core last year. Um, it was head scratching right? The number of yeah. drops and people pointed out, did Devin Leary have a catchable ball? Well, um, you know, I think that responsibility goes around, uh, the, you know, the offense in terms of some of those bad, uh, statistics, but they went out and got some kids, um, you know, in the portal that a lot of people wanted. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, an increase in competition in, in the, in the spring for, um, that starting rotation, um, and both, you know, at least as of right now, Dane Key and, and Barry on Brown, both are returning uh, for for next season. I know it's not that simple because lines have got to get cohesive. But, the, you know, we mentioned a couple of kids that played a lot of ball. Um, yeah. I, I would presume an upgrade at quarterback. Hard to say. Brock Vandegrift was, you know, five star kid out of high school, but hadn't played yet. Right. right. So you just you don't know for sure. But I, I would I would bet on it that he's going to be pretty good. I feel like almost by accident they have to be better in the passing. And now losing Ray Davis um is is not going to help things. Uh, but Kentucky's always been able to find running backs. Now I don't know how many of them will pass block as well as Ray did at times. But I, I feel like just ch chances are everything else being the same, they're gonna be better in the passing game. Well, they will. I mean, first of all, I mean Vandergrift's six five. Devin yeah. Leary's six six feet, maybe six one. And there were a lot of times when, you know, balls would be batted down at the line. There was a vision mm -hmm. problem, right, with that kid, I think, uh, much of the year. And this is more of a, a, a Liam Cohen-type quarterback with the offense that, that Kentucky runs, uh, similar in a lot of regards to, to what Georgia ran. So I think that was part of the reason why Vandergrift chose to come to Kentucky. I think the learning curve will be uh, fairly straightforward for him um, but this guy's a prototypical SEC quarterback and he's tough. He can make all the throws. And I mean, it, it can't get much worse in the passing game than last year. So you would, you would hope if you can protect the kid and if he can stay healthy, um, you know, we should see some good things. You mentioned at the running back position, Ray Davis does go off to the NFL, uh, but Kentucky was successful in bringing, um, a starting running back quality running back uh, from Ohio state that a lot of people wanted uh, a starter for much of uh, the season two years ago, but certainly a, a kind of a one, a type of, of running back with a lot of size, some good speed at Ohio state uh, probably presumably is the starter coming into spring ball. Um, so that was a huge get Vince Merrill, uh, Mark Stoops, obviously from Youngstown um, know a lot of those kids went up and, and were able to to get one there to to come in and, and fill that void. So um, again, it's all on paper, as you said, and we don't know until we know. But I think Kentucky feels pretty good about where it is on offense going into spring. Stuart, it's been a lot of fun. Any anything we didn't get to? Parting thoughts, et cetera, on the way out here. I, no, it's it's always good to connect, and um, yeah, again, the Kentucky Wildcats, uh, you know, have a have a slate of games here on the basketball uh, or on the hardwood coming up, and let's just see how they respond. Uh, they're going to have plenty of opportunities, so it's always a fun time as we transition into February. We start to see what these teams are are going to look like. 
SEC tournament plays right around the corner and uh, be here before you know it. So um, yeah. should be a should be an exciting uh, number of weeks coming up. I, I cannot wait for it. Th- this time of the year is so much fun because this is when basketball gets serious. Uh, I think the league's got a bunch of good teams. I think it's got some potentially great teams. I think it's got multiple teams that things break right could win a national title. I think it's yeah. it's fairly competitive in the middle, even into the bottom half. Um, and then, then we got baseball coming up, uh, Kentucky that's right. getting, getting a lot better in baseball. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I think that's going to be fun. I, I think that the fan base finally started to dial into that a little bit at the end of the year by the regional attendance. So yeah, what the, I always hate January and February in some ways, hate January, yeah. just the cold, mm-hmm. um, you know, short days. February comes to get a little bit of peak. Of more yeah. sunshine and what's to come, and then we hit March, and boy, that's my favorite time of the year. So, absolutely, man. Well, thanks so much. Always a pleasure, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right, he's Stuart Lackey. I'm Chris Lee. This is Southeastern 14 presented by Bet Online.